questions? Doesn't have to be on the subject matter. No? Okay. One thing that um, I was asked uh, to do when uh, I was approached to, to talk to, to all of you um, concerning Southwest peoples and Southwest tribes were practices. Um, a little bit of, of my own history. Being born and raised in Prescott, I was not raised with traditional Hopi custom or practices. Uh, my parents were products of the boarding school system in this country. And if you are unfamiliar, boarding school system began approximately 1886. And the first boarding school was established in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My great-grandfather uh, was sent there. And its um, objective was to help us assimilate into mainstream society. Basically, it was to rid us of being Indian. And uh, oddly enough, the government thought that they could do it that way. <laughs> Educate us out of who we are. Well, it didn't work. But it sort of worked with some, and, it, and I believe that it worked with my parents. My parents were first generation off reservation from the Hopi reservation. I am first generation born and raised outside of that environment. So they made the decision not to speak the language in our home. All I heard was English uh, growing up. They also made the decision through historical circumstances within our family not to introduce, to introduce us to native culture, Hopi culture whatsoever. So I knew nothing of the customs and the practices um, at all growing up. Where I received my education was when I graduated from Northern Arizona University in 1977. And it was at that time I made the decision to go out to the Hopi Reservation. And my intent was to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I had two degrees. I had nowhere to go. I was broke. You know how that is. And um, what am I going to do? And I still, to this day, do not know why I asked my mother if there were relatives I could stay with on the Hopi Reservation. It seemed like the best place to go with no distraction of any kind. City environment, urban environment, my friends, and so on, and what have you. And off I go to the Hopi Reservation. 22 years old. Now just imagine one of your children at 22 years old coming home and going, hey, I'm going to go out into this foreign culture and I'm going to stay there for three and a half months. I have no understanding of the language or the customs and I'm going to go anyway. And I'm sure that it was um, confusing to my parents, especially my mother. Well, off I go to Hopi and, and I had no intent of actually returning to the Hopi Reservation after that first summer. It's the worst summer I've ever spent in my life. But I did return, and that summer one turned into three summers and to six summers. All of a sudden, I am making it a routine of going to Hopi uh, every summer. And that actually was the beginning of my Hopi education at the age of 22. Now, what have I learned since then? Oh gosh, a great deal. Some of the practices, very common, and I noticed that this is some of these practices that I will describe to you are common among all tribes, at least here in the Southwest. Uh, I just retired three years ago from um, Yavapai College in Prescott, I was Native American Programs Coordinator for the college, and I worked with the tribes of Central and Northern Arizona. So I was in contact with many elders, with many culture groups, and so on, uh, for about 12 years. So I, I learned a great deal about these other people uh, also. But common practices that I discovered through uh, making mistakes, putting my foot in my mouth, uh, just, just being who I am and not knowing. One, the one thing
thing that people notice about me, especially uh, from my uh, age group and higher, what we would refer to as elders, I will not look at you directly in your eyes. And if I do, it's just for a brief moment. It's not very long. What this is, is showing respect for you as an individual, as an elder. The staring at you in the eyes is a sign of very deep disrespect. Mm -hmm. So we're taught this from when we're little. So the one thing that I, I've realized through being an educator all these years is that teachers who are not familiar with this custom, at least among the southwestern tribes, they always seem to believe that they're native students, that there's something wrong. And they don't realize that the children are just simply extending their respect, especially when younger children will not look at the teacher at all. And they seem to always be looking at the ground or looking somewhere else. It's a sign of respect. Um, this I had to learn. I used to look at my elders in the eyes directly because that's what I was taught by Western culture. Oh, I got a lecture one day, I got one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and explained why I should not be doing that. Well, I no longer do that. Um, in connection with this also is how you approach uh, primarily adults. Um, I will never extend my hand to a woman. Ever. That is, again, the highest sign of disrespect to you as a woman. Um, I will only extend my hand to a woman if she extends hers first. So I keep my hands in my pocket. Uh, I'm famous for this. Uh, keeping my hands in my pocket and I'll just wait. If she does not extend her hand, that is not a sign of unfriendliness. She is just uh, indicating to, uh, to me that there is definitely a very strong boundary there. And um, so I keep my hands in my pocket. Now a man, I'll extend my hand to. I'll extend my hand to a man. But I do not grip his hand and try to break it. <laughs> It's the American Western way, you know, you got to show your strength and so on. Oh, very negative attribute for a man to do that. When I go to shake hands, and actually it's not shaking hands, it's barely touching hands with a native man. I extend my hand and we'll touch. We don't even grip. Why? Because we don't know who the other person is. Now, if I had a long extended relationship with the male that I'm meeting or encountering, such as one of my uncles, I will extend my hand, he will grab my hand, and we will actually hold hands for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. This is indicating not only to the two of us, but anyone who is witnessing this encounter that there is a special bond there between these um, two males. So I've, I've learned that over the years. Um, another interesting practice that I find common among tribes in Arizona, um, how to ask questions. Um, you would think, well, that's easy. You just ask why. Um, Westerners and Western Europeans are, are very famous for asking why. Uh, why in the native uh, frame of mind is a skeptical question. Because eventually, once I give you the explanation, you're going to ask why again. It's common. Well, why? You're never going to be satisfied. So I learned how to ask questions. I'll ask, who? So who brought this? Or where? Where did it come from? Or how? How did it get here? Now see, if I ask those questions, it's going to cause me to stop and have to figure out, okay, they're asking, where did it come from? How far do I go back? 
Now you're going to get a story, you're going to get an explanation, probably more than what you wanted. 